Hello, can everybody hear me? Is my screen visible? You all can react with an emoji or the thumbs up. Is my screen visible? Am I audible? Is everything okay? All right. It's so, yeah. I hope you all can see my screen. Is it visible? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so today we will be discussing about the unit structure of matter. This is the third lesson of your grade 10 syllabus, which is basically an introduction to chemistry. Okay, so we will be discussing about structure of matter. This is a free session conducted by the Knowledge Institute. So. I hope you all will get the maximum benefit and stay till the end of the session. So, shall we start? Okay, let's kick start the session by introducing what is matter. Okay. So, first of all, you if you... Ah, uh, sorry. Okay, shall we, shall we start the session then? I hope you all can hear me clearly. I hope I'm loud and clear. So shall we start the session? Okay. Sure. So let's start the session. Structure of matter. If you uh, take this... Okay. I hope you all, are, you all can hear me. Y'all can hear me, right? Y'all can hear me, right? I hope y'all yes, can hear. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so we'll be studying about the lesson structure of structure of matter, which is the third unit of your grade 10 syllabus. So this is a very important unit when it comes to answering chemistry-based questions. 
because the unit is basically an introduction to chemistry. If you know this unit thoroughly, you can answer any question. You can answer any question based on chemistry. Understood? So let's start the session. If you take matter, if you take matter, okay. Now, you, if you take matter, you can say that matter is anything which occupies space and has a mass. Which occupies space and has a mass. So, if you take the structure of matter, we will be studying about the structure of matter. Okay. If you take matter, how do we call matter? Something which occupies space and which has a mass is known as matter. If you take structure of matter, we will be discussing about the structure of matter. Okay. So, basically, if you take something, if you take an eraser, pencil, any tangible object, if you take such an object, okay, these objects occupy space as well as these objects have a mass. So, you call these things as matter. Today, in this session, we will be discussing about the structure, about how the matter is formed. Okay. So, let's start. Basically, if you take matter, if you take matter, okay, matter is divided into two categories. It is divided into two categories based on their composition. Based on their composition. Now, the meeting will be ending around 9.30 or 9.15, I guess, since we have to cover the full unit. So, let's, let's speed up the matters a bit, okay? So, first of all, I'll be teaching you a structure of matter. I'll be giving an introduction and then directly skip into the lesson, okay? If you take structure of matter, we are studying about the structure of matter. Matter is something which occupies space and which has a mass, okay? And if you take the structure of matter, if you take matter, matter is divided into two categories based on its composition. One is chemical composition and the other one is physical composition. Throughout the lesson, we will be focusing towards the chemical composition, okay? Based on how the matter is based on its composition, matter is divided into two types such as chemical and physical composition. So, under the chemical composition, matter is further classified into pure substances and non-pure substances. Pure substances and non-pure substances, okay? You have matter. Matter is divided into two categories based on its composition, based on its composition namely chemical and physical, then the chemical components are further divided into pure substances and non-pure substances, while the physical components are easy to remember. It's just solid, liquid and gas. It's just solid, liquid and gas, okay? If you take the chemical composition of a matter, it is divided into pure and non-pure substances. The pure substances are the substances which contains one element or one compound, okay, which contains one element or one compound. Basically, the pure substances that does not involve any external matter inside, okay. So, when it comes to chemical composition, it divides into pure substances and non-pure substances. The non-pure substances, we call the non-pure substances from another name that is called mixtures. That is called mixtures, okay? We have pure and non-pure substances. The non-pure substances is known as mixtures, okay? And then, as I said, your matter is classified into two as physical and chemical, okay? First one, based on their composition, is physical and chemical. If you take physical, it's solid, liquid, and gas. If you take chemical, you can divide it into pure substances and Non-pure substances. If you take non-pure substances, basically we have another name. We used to call the non-pure substances as mixtures. We used to call the non-pure substances as mixtures. Okay. So, pure substances and non-pure substances. But if you take the pure substances, the pure substances can be further classified into elements and compound. Element and compound okay so the pure substances based based on chemical composition it is also further divided into two categories as pure and non-pure then the pure substances are further divided into elements and compounds while the mixtures are also further divided into two homogeneous and 
heterogeneous, homogeneous, and heterogeneous. Matter is divided into two based on its composition, physical and chemical. Physical is divided into solid, liquid, and gas, which you all already know. Solid particles, liquid particles, and gaseous particles. And if you take according to the chemical composition, it is further divided into pure substances and non-pure substances. Non-pure substances are known as mixtures. And then the pure substance is further divided into element and compound. Meanwhile, the mixtures are divided into homogeneous mixtures and the heterogeneous mixtures. I hope you all are clear till that part. This is just the classification of matter. It's just the introduction. We haven't come to the lesson yet. I hope you all are clear with that. Okay. Moving on to the next part. If you take elements and compounds, now let's say if you take elements and compounds. Now, first of all, as I said, your elements and compounds fall under the category of pure substances, right? Under pure substances only, elements and compounds are classified, okay? So, under pure substances, when you have elements as well as compounds, elements, we have many elements like oxygen, Fe is iron, okay? You call it as ferrum and it's iron. Then if you take copper, these are elements. Why? They are like single substances, sole substances, okay? Oxygen is just one gas, while iron, it's one metal. Copper is also metal, okay? They are just one. You can call it a sole, okay? Just one, okay? It isn't mixed with anything. Oxygen is just, just the oxygen. But if you take the compounds, the compounds are like addition of two or three elements. Now, if you take H2O, hydrogen and oxygen. Hydrogen and oxygen, which means the combination of elements. And then when another substance combines and then it forms the non-pure substances. So basically, you call it compounds under pure substances. We didn't come for non-pure substances yet. So two elements are forming compounds. Or you can say CO2. CO2 is carbon dioxide. If you take carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide, basically carbon and oxygen. So these two elements are getting together, combining and forming a compound. Okay. These are falling under the category of pure substances. I hope you understood till that. Okay. I hope you understood till that. So matter is classified into physical and chemical. Under chemical, it divides into non-pure and pure. Under pure, it divides into elements and compounds. Element is just, just one, okay? Iron, copper, oxygen. But it, when it comes to compounds, the, it's the addition of two elements, like hydrogen plus oxygen, carbon plus oxygen. So the compounds are formed with the addition of two or more elements, okay? So you all have to know. You all have to know further about these things, okay? So pure substances are further divided into elements and compounds. So today we will be studying about the structure of this matter. Okay. We will be studying about the structure of this matter. I hope it's clear for you all. Okay. So if you take matter, if you take matter, atoms are the building particle of matter. Atoms are the building particle of matter. Now let's say this is matter. This whole thing is known as matter. Inside this matter, you can find atoms. Atom 1, atom 2, atom 3, something like that. A collection of atoms is the term given for matter. Okay? Collection of atoms is the term given for matter. Because when there are many atoms forming together collectively, when they are gathering together, when it's collected together, it is forming matter. Okay? Matter is formed by the collection of atoms, okay? Matter is formed by collection of atoms. By the collection of atoms, okay? Matter is formed by the collection of atoms. Atoms are the building unit of matter, okay? Atoms are the building unit. It's the building unit of matter. Okay, so first of all, you all have to know what is matter and what are these atoms and everything. So if I have to say regarding matter, there will be many atoms which are <clears throat> collectively combining in order to form matter. 
okay so atom is considered as the building unit of matter and matter is formed by the collection of atoms okay i hope it's clear till that part fine and then if you move on to the next part of your lesson we are having this very interesting thing called the planetary model of atom okay planetary model of atom now if you take an atom this is how an atom looks like okay this is the microscopic view or the 3d view of an atom okay so the planetary module of an atom was introduced by none other than ernest rutherford so ernest rutherford was the pioneer who introduced the planetary model of the atom okay planetary model of the atom was introduced by ernest rutherford so can you see this is the planetary model or this is the microscopic view of an atom okay this is what i have drawn is an atom okay and if you take the atom the particles or the subatomic particles which are in the middle of the atom consists of protons and neutrons protons and neutrons while the outer shell of the atom in the outer shell of the atom there are some subatomic particles which are roaming around the shells of the atom you call this as electrons you call this as electrons okay first of all if you take an atom you have protons and neutrons in the center you call this as subatomic particles if you say the subatomic particles we consider protons neutrons and electrons as the subatomic particles okay these are the sub atomic particles okay subatomic particles so if you take the atom this is a structure of an atom the planetary module of an atom in the middle of the atom you can find protons and neutrons in this you know in the outside of the atom okay in the background or if you say the electronic shells of the atom you can find the electrons so protons neutrons and electrons are considered to be the subatomic particles of an atom and the planetary model of an atom was introduced by sir ernest rutherford okay introduced by sir ernest rutherford now if you take this atom now let's say i am drawing an atom this is my atom okay i have this things called the energy levels i call this as the energy levels it's not me usually we call these as the energy levels of an atom why in the center of the atom you can find protons and neutrons you can find protons and neutrons so i'll just write in your language it's proton and neutrons but in the energy level in the energy level of an atom you can find electrons you can find you can call it as energy level energy shell okay basically we call this as the energy level okay now if you take energy levels of an atom there are four energy levels there are four energy levels okay four energy levels in the sense you have two eight eight sixteen k l m n if you all have studied this unit before you all would have you all would know how to draw the energy levels of an atom but if you would study it now let me explain it to you k l m n are the energy levels of an atom these are the four energy levels of an atom so basically if you take the first energy level if you take the first energy level you can only shoot you can only put two electrons that's all for the first energy level of an atom you can just put only two electrons you can't go beyond that okay but if you take the second energy level you can put eight electrons in the second energy level so basically the number which is given here is the maximum electrons which you can fill an energy level with okay suppose you have a one energy level okay you have one energy level only two electrons can be put for the first energy level but if you have two energy levels in the second energy level you can squeeze eight electrons but this is the maximum number of electron for the respective energy level 
if if this is the first energy level only two electrons if this is the second energy level only eight electrons if this is the third energy level only eight electrons but here there should be a small correction they have mentioned in the textbook as 32 but you can also put it as 18 because more than 32 we don't usually go for 32 in this syllabus itself so you can put it as 18 but usually we used to regard it as 32 okay don't need to think much 28832 fine so that is all about energy levels let me draw one and show in order to draw energy levels, first of all, we have to have a good understanding or we have to have a good knowledge about the periodic table. What is the periodic table? The elements of our Earth are classified into a periodic table. If you start from this, hydrogen, if I start from hydrogen, This is the periodic table in your syllabus. You all should have memorized the periodic table by now. Okay. Starting off with hydrogen, helium, lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, something like that. You have 20 elements in the periodic table in your grade 10 syllabus. Okay. In your grade 10 syllabus, there are 20 elements in the periodic table which you will be studying. Okay. In the periodic table, for each and every element, we can draw an atomic structure. We can draw an atomic structure by using the energy levels. By using the knowledge of energy levels, we can draw an atomic structure. Now, let's say I'm drawing for hydrogen. Okay. I am drawing for hydrogen. Or let's say, let's say a common one. Usually, what do we use? We used to use for sodium. Right. We used to use for sodium. Now, let's say I am drawing the atomic structure or the energy level energy level diagram okay i am drawing the energy level diagram for sodium okay now if you say 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 11 sodium is the 11th element of the periodic table it is the 11th element of the periodic table so which means it should consist of 11 electrons okay let me explain it further first of all let me explain the energy level diagram how to draw that and then i will be explaining everything in detail Okay, if it's sodium, if it's the 11th element of the periodic table, there should be 11 electrons, right? So, if you write Na in the center, which represents the sodium element, okay, we are going to draw the energy level diagram for the element sodium. If you put oh, okay. N, okay, there are 11 electrons. Now, according to the energy level, we should know how to put the electrons, how to fill the energy levels with the respective electrons. As I said, you 2, 8, 8, 32 is the standard order of the electronic levels in the respective energy shells. Okay. So, for the first energy level, you can put 2 electrons. For the second energy level, you can put 8 electrons. Then, altogether, there are 10 electrons here. But we need 11 electrons, right? Then, 1 electron is not enough. So, for the third energy level, we have to put 1 electron. Why? Now, if you take... The 11 electrons here, it is dividing into three energy levels, okay? It is dividing into three energy levels. We have to draw three energy levels around sodium. So, for the first energy level, we have two electrons. For the second energy level, okay, we have eight electrons. For the third energy level, we can't put eight, right? Because it's 11, okay? Because it's 11, we can't put eight, okay? We can't put eight. It exceeds 11 electrons. So, what we have to do is we have to put one. Out of this 8, we have to just put 1 for sodium, okay? Just for sodium. Then, okay, now I have sodium. Now I have sodium. I am going to draw the energy level diagram. Draw your first energy level diagram. Draw your first energy level. Put 2 electrons and then draw the second energy level. Fill it with 8 electrons. And then draw the third energy level. Put one electron. This is the energy level diagram for sodium. Okay, this is the energy level diagram for sodium. Two electrons in the first shell. Eight, eight electrons in the second shell. One electron in the third shell gives you a sum of 11 electrons for the sodium. 
element okay for the element sodium okay this is how you draw energy level diagrams but if you take another one now let's say okay i do 11 electrons for sodium let's draw and see for neon okay let's draw and see for neon so remember the order 2 8 8 32 this is stipulated order of the electrons in each energy shell okay 2 8 8 32 then let's say for neon okay 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 Sodium has 11 electrons. Neon has 10 electrons. Okay. Neon has 10 electrons. It just has 10 electrons. Then put neon in the center. 2 electrons in the first shell. 8 electrons in the second shell. Did you have to You go to a third energy shell? Did you have to go to another ring? No. Because 10 electrons are satisfied with 2 and 8 by the first two energy levels we have almost drawn 10 electrons we have filled the shells with 10 electrons if it is more than 10 only you have to go to the third energy level like for sodium i had to draw three energy levels but for neon i only had to draw two energy levels the reason is i have almost completed 10 electrons by drawing in the neon energy level diagram okay Fine. Now we know how to draw energy level diagram. So in this session, we will be going through each and every detail. We have we'll be going through each and every subtopic in detail. So now what I taught you was how to draw an energy level diagram based on the uh, based on the maximum number of electrons in each level. Okay. So as you know, the planetary model of an atom. Planetary model of an atom was introduced or introduced by Ernest Rutherford. Mr. Ernest Rutherford introduced the planetary model of an atom. Okay. Planetary model of an atom was introduced by Ernest Rutherford. Then further. Okay. Further his theory. His theory was further elaborated by Niels Bohr. By Niels Bohr, Ernest Rutherford's theory was further elaborated okay first of all Ernest Rutherford introduced introduced the planetary model of an atom and then Niels Bohr further elaborated his theory further elaborated his theory so basically what are they going to say is the planetary model of an atom was introduced by Ernest Rutherford but then came an individual named Niels Bohr Niels Bohr further elaborated the theory of Rutherford Okay, and then they discovered the energy level diagram, how to, draw, how to draw the energy level diagram for each and every element in the periodic table and then how many electrons are belonging to each energy shell. Okay, that's what was discovered later words. So the four energy levels are K, L, M, N and then two electrons, two electrons, sorry, two, eight, eight and 32, the respective electrons for each energy level. I hope you understood till this. Okay, that is all about what we have studied. Okay. First of all, we studied about the classification of matter. Then we studied about the planetary model of an atom. Okay, we studied about the planetary model of an atom. Who introduced it? Who further elaborated it? And then we studied how to draw an energy level diagram based on the electrons. Based on electrons. Number of electrons. And then next we will be moving on to atomic number and mass number. Atomic number and mass number. So it is the atomic number. Here you have the mass number. Okay, we'll be discussing about atomic number and the mass number. If you say the atomic number of an element, okay, now let me say hydrogen. Hydrogen, now if you say the atomic number, atomic number is the number of protons in an atom, okay, number of protons in an atom. So, atomic number is very easy, okay. Now, let's say the same periodic table, let's draw it in a side. Yes, sorry. Do you have any doubts? Okay, so I hope you are clear. If it is the atomic number and mass number of an element, okay, 
Now let's say I am taking the sodium atom as usual. Okay, sodium atom is very easy to handle. With. So if you take the sodium atom, what is now what's the atomic number of the sodium atom? How many protons are there? How many electrons are there? Fine. If you take the same periodic table which I drew, you will see that the position of sodium in the periodic table is 11. Sodium bears the 11th position in the periodic table. Okay. Sodium bears the 11th position in the periodic table. So basically, sodium has 11 protons. Okay. Sodium has 11 protons and the number of protons is equal to the number of electrons. Okay. First of all, we are studying about the atomic number. We are studying it under sodium. The example we have is sodium. Okay. For the ones who have joined, uh, for the ones who have joined once again, we are studying about atomic number and mass number. And then if you take sodium, sodium is the element and the atomic number. So if you take sodium, there are 11 protons. 11 protons for sodium and then the number of protons equals to the number of electrons. Protons equals to the number of electrons. Okay. Now let's say, now let's say sodium has 11 protons, which basically means sodium has 11 electrons as well. Okay. Sodium has 11 electrons as well. As the protons, electrons and neutrons are the subatomic particles of an atom, they even bear a particular charge. Okay. They even bear a particular charge. I forgot to mention this before under subatomic particles. If you take proton, okay, you have then, you have neutron and then you have electron. Okay. Then you have electron. If you take proton, the charge of a proton is positive. It is always positive. If you take electron, the charge of an electron is negative. It is always minus. But neutron has no charge. It is a neutral charge. Okay. Neutrons have no charge. It is neutral. Okay. Give me a minute. Okay, I hope you all can see the screen here. So, we were discussing about atomic number and the subatomic particles. If you take the subatomic particles of an atom, you have proton, neutron and electron. Proton has a positive charge. Neutron has a neutral charge, which means it is neither positive nor negative. And if you take electron, it has a negative charge. So, positive, neutral, negative. Proton, neutron, electron. And then if you take the atomic number of an element, it is where the position of the element is in the periodic table. If you take sodium, sodium is in the 11th position, which means it has 11 protons and the number of protons equals to number of electrons. So sodium has 11 protons. Basically, it has also 11 electrons, then 11 then 11 protons is equals to 11 electrons in sodium. Okay, in the sodium atom, you have 11 protons as well as 11 electrons. The number of electrons is decided by the number of protons present in the atom. If you say there are 11 protons in the atom, if you say there are 11 protons in the atom, then there are 11 electrons as well. So sodium is the 11th position in the periodic table. There are 11 protons as well as 11 electrons. Fine. If you have to write, okay, if you have to write now, if you are thorough with this, you have to display. You have to know how to display. There is a standard way of displaying the atomic number and the mass number of an element, okay? So, mass number is, atomic number is the number of protons. And atomic number is the number of protons. Mass number is the number of Protons plus neutrons. It is the sum of protons plus neutrons. Now, let's say there are 11 protons. Then is it equal to 11 neutrons? No. 11, proto 11 protons plus 11 neutrons gives us the mass number. Basically, 
basically if you add the protons if you add the protons with neutrons if you add the protons with neutrons you get the mass number an atomic number is the number of protons i hope you understood till this can you all give me a thumbs up if you understood till this good okay i hope you understood okay so first of all i as i said you we were studying about the atomic number we are discussing about the number of protons and then when we are moving to mass number we are adding both protons plus neutrons then we get the mass number atomic number is the number of protons or the position of the element position of the particular element in the periodic table if you take mass number addition of protons and neutrons will give the resultant of the mass number and then if you move further in the lesson there is a standard way okay a standard way or a standard method of writing or of displaying an element okay of displaying an element so if you say sodium as well if you say sodium once again the topmost okay here you have to mention the mass number of the respective element and then here you have to mention the atomic number of the respective element if you take sodium sodium is an element in the periodic table which is in the 11th position which is in the 11th position and which also has 11 protons okay the atomic number of sodium is 11 and then if you take the standard method of displaying an element okay the standard way of displaying an element we are start, we are talking about sodium we are discussing about sodium you have the mass number of sodium on the top and the atomic number of sodium in the bottom so you have displayed the mass number of sodium on top the atomic number of sodium in bottom and then there are 11 protons of sodium so now let's see how can we display the how can we standardly display an element this is sodium okay this is sodium and then you should know that the mass number of sodium is 23 okay the mass number of sodium is 23 okay usually they don't ask questions to like display but you have to know how to display and those things okay because the lesson is very important it will be very useful for you so if you take sodium if you take the element sodium you have to display the mass number. So mass number in the sense 23 is the mass number. Okay, 23 is the mass number. Sum of protons and sum of neutrons. So how many protons are there? How many protons are there for sodium? There are 11 protons for sodium. And if the atomic, if the mass number is 23, if you minus 11, you can find the number of neutrons, which is 12. So sodium has 11 protons. 12 neutrons all together it can form and sum up to 23 which is the mass number of sodium okay now we have displayed the mass number of sodium and then if you have to write about the atomic number of sodium it is none other than 11 because the atomic number is basically the number of protons so 11 is the atomic number 23 is the mass number of sodium this is how you have to standardly display the element okay 23 is the mass number. 11 Excellent. is the... Yes. Yes, dear. Um, it's for the exams, will they give the mass number or do we have to find the mass number and write? It is something like this, dear. Now, if you, if you are facing the exam, now if they ask you to display, they will never give you something like this and say you to mark on the particular place. But in MCQs, if you have a thorough knowledge, now, usually we can't judge the mass number, okay? If they give the number of electrons, if they give the number of protons, and if they give the number of neutrons. Now, basically, if we have to find the mass number, the only criteria which is needed is protons and neutrons. So, in the exam, if they have given you protons and neutrons, you can easily find the mass number. And if they have given the mass number and the number of protons, then you can find neutrons, okay? It's basically... With what they have given, you should find what is missing and then display. Did you understand? Yes, miss. Thank you. Yeah. You are welcome, dear. Yeah. 
Okay, as I said to you, as we have now, you all have to know if they have given sodium, it is 11 atomic number, 23 is the mass number. So sodium is the element, 23 is the mass number, 11 is the atomic number. This is the standard way of display an atom by using the mass number as well as the atomic number. Okay, by using the mass number as well as the atomic number, this is how you should standardly display an element. Okay, I hope you understood because it is something which you should be more concerned of. Now, let's say they have said the number of electrons in the sodium atom is 11. The number of protons in the sodium atom is also 11. The mass number of sodium is 23. Find the number of neutrons. So, you have to find this. Now, you should know. Okay, if you have to find the mass number, mass number is basically protons plus neutrons. Then, if they have given 11 protons, and then they haven't given the number of neutrons. You have to find x. But the mass number is 23. Okay, now if you subtract 11 from 23, you get 12. So the number of neutrons in a sodium atom is 12. Same like that from what they have given. We have to substitute it according to what we have. And then we have to find the remaining term. Here we have been assigned to find the number of neutrons. With the number of mass, with the mass number and protons. So, obviously, if you deduct 11 from 23, you get 12 as the number of neutrons for the standard sodium atom. I hope you understood. Okay? Fine. So, that is basically how you have to display the standard. Now, it's how you display an element in a correct manner. Okay? So, today in our session, we are not planning to finish the whole lesson because it will be confusing for you all. So, what I am planning to do is, first of all, I am planning to give you all the classification for matter. And once we are done with the classification, we have to study about the planetary module. We almost discussed about the planetary module, which was introduced by Ernest Rutherford and further elaborated by Niels Bohr. And then classification, planetary model, and then we have to know how to draw the Energy level diagram. Energy level diagram should be drawn and we do for we do for helium. No, we do for neon as well as for sodium. Right? I do for sodium as well as for neon. And then now I taught you all the standard way of writing an element. Standard way of writing an element. Okay. So basically, first of all, we study the classification. Planetary module, energy level diagram, and then the standard way of writing an element. Then we are moving on to electronic configuration, which is basically very easy. Like I taught you all from by drawing, but here we are going to study by writing the symbols. Okay. Now, if you take hydrogen, helium, lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, if you take these elements, if you take these elements, these elements are found in the periodic table. Okay, you can find these elements in the periodic table. Now, if you take, now the position of these elements in the periodic table. Hydrogen is standing first in the periodic table. Helium is second. Lithium is third. Beryllium is fourth. Boron is fifth. Carbon is sixth. Nitrogen is seventh. Like that even, it will continue. Okay. And then when it comes to like this, as I said you, the position of the element in the periodic table relieves or it reveals how many protons are present in the particular element. If there is one proton in hydrogen, then it's just one energy level. Okay, two in the cells, one. But when it comes to lithium, when it comes to lithium, one proton in the, sorry, one electron, energy levels are always based on electrons, people. Okay, so lithium, one electron in the first energy level and two electrons in the second energy level. Altogether, three, which means three electrons. This is the number of electrons of the particular element. Okay, hydrogen is one, helium two, lithium three, beryllium four, boron five, carbon six, nitrogen seven. Basically, that is how you draw energy level diagrams by understanding the number of electrons in a particular atom. Okay, that is how you should draw element, symbol and energy level diagram. Okay, and then we have to study about the modern periodic table as well. Okay.
okay so so what i have drawn is the modern periodic table okay the modern periodic table that is what i have drawn okay so if they ask you who introduced the modern periodic table they are, you can say it as dimitri mendeleev dimitri mendeleev was scientist who introduced or discovered the modern periodic table with this number of elements okay if you take hydrogen helium and all these elements are segregated and they are classified into periods and groups okay periods and groups if you take the modern periodic table now in uh -huh. in your syllabus there will only be there will only be 20 elements in your periodic table okay there will only be 20 elements in your periodic table so if you take your periodic table you can see okay some are going down some are going sideways right some are going down some are going sideways whatever the elements which are going down now it's a pattern we are studying the pattern of the periodic table now, if you say 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, okay? Now, whatever these columns, the columns found in the periodic table are known as groups. The columns found in the periodic table are known as groups. Why? They are going vertically, okay? They are going down vertically. So, you call it as... Eight, seven. Seven. Okay, so fine. So if you take the periodic table, you can see now in this periodic table, you have the columns. The columns in the periodic table are known as group. Okay, column, you call it as group. But then if you take the rows of the periodic table, okay, now they are going horizontally these are the rows the rows of the periodic table the rows of the periodic table are known as periods are known as periods okay so whatever is going like this you call it as periods whatever is coming down you call it as group so whenever you have to find the position of an element okay whenever you have to find the position of an element in the periodic table let me draw the periodic table once again since it's not clear Uh, it's Aza. Let's talk for five minutes, girls and boys.
Okay, let's start. Okay, so now what I have drawn here is the modern periodic table, which is in your syllabus. Okay, which is in your syllabus. You just have to study about these 20 elements, their positions, their energy levels and everything. But when you go to your A levels, you have to study more advanced than this. There will be more elements than this. You have to know about the properties of those elements and everything. So you will be having a vast knowledge regarding this chapter when you go to your A levels. But for now, your syllabus is very simple. You just have to study about the 20 elements. That's all. Okay. So the modern periodic table was introduced or found by Dimitri Mendeleev. Dimitri Mendeleev was the person who found the modern periodic table. And then the horizontal rows are called periods. The vertical columns are known as groups. There are four periods in the modern periodic table and then eight groups. Eight groups in the periodic table, which is in your syllabus. Okay. Now, let me say, if you, if they say you to find or to describe the position of boron. Okay. They are saying you to, okay, write the position of boron. Position of boron. Okay, then this is boron. You have to say boron is in the second period, third group. Okay, so if they ask, now sometimes they might say, what is the element which is located in the third period, fourth group? So the third period, fourth group. What is the element? It is silicon. Sometimes if they ask, name the element which is in the second period, eighth group. Second period, eighth group, which is none other than neon. Something like that. You have to be very thorough with the periodic table. Who introduced the periodic table? And then the periods, groups, and the patterns seen around the periodic table. You have to have a very thorough knowledge regarding the positions of the periodic table. Like the positions of the elements in the periodic table. If they say hydrogen, first group, first period. If they say beryllium, second period, second group. If they say sulfur, Third period, sixth group, something like that. You have to be very thorough with the periodic table. For that, you have to memorize the periodic table. How to draw the periodic ta table properly, okay? How to draw the periodic table. For this chapter, knowing the periodic table, the ability to draw the periodic table is the must, okay? It is a must. You have to know how to draw the periodic table, how to identify the groups as well as periods, and how you can find the elements respective to the groups and periods, okay? I hope you understood. So, basically, it was introduced by Dimitri Mendeley, who was a scientist, okay? Who was a scientist and who was a Russian scientist. He was from Russia and he is a Russian scientist. Okay, Dmitry Mendeleev. He is the one who introduced the modern periodic table. Fine. So now I hope you all gained a good knowledge regarding chapter. Okay, now sometimes your knowledge would have got refreshed. Okay, you would have recapped something which you have missed. Okay, so if you take this, you know, if you take these elements, the periodic table and all these stuffs, you have something which is a bit important for you, known as isotopes. Known as isotopes. Okay. What is this isotopes? So isotopes is, it is the same atomic number but different mass number. Okay. So it is the same atomic number but different mass number. Now say me, how can the atomic number change? How can the atomic number change? No, atomic number will never change. But how can the mass number change? Will the number of protons change? Okay, protons is the atomic number. Protons, protons is the atomic number. Protons is the atomic number. So will the atomic number change? No. Then what will change? The mass number will change. The mass number will change. In the mass number, can the protons change? The protons cannot change. Okay, in the mass number, the protons cannot change okay the proton cannot change but can the neutron change can the number of neutron change yes the number of neutron can change why if the neutrons didn't change then it won't be an isotope okay if nothing change then it won't be an isotope for it to be an isotope the mass number should change in the mass number proton shouldn't change only the neutron should change okay Isotope is the same atomic number, same atomic number, but 
different mass number. Different mass number. Same atomic number, but different mass number. So basically, if you take isotopes, if you take isotopes, in your syllabus, we will be studying only the isotopes of hydrogen. So hydrogen gas or the hydrogen element. We are studying about the hydrogen element. Okay. So the hydrogen element has three isotopes. Isotopes in the same, same atomic number, different mass number. Same atomic number in the sense, can the number of protons change? No, only the number of neutrons will change. So hydrogen has three isotopes named protium, deuterium, and tritium. Protium, deuterium, and tritium. These are the isotopes of hydrogen, okay? These are the isotopes of hydrogen. Now, if you take protium, okay? If you take protium, this is the standard representation of protium. One, one. So the mass number is also one. Atomic number is also one. Okay. But if you take deuterium, deuterium, it is hydrogen is two. This is one. So basically, the mass number is two. Atomic number is one. Mass number is also one. Atomic number is also one. Here, there are zero neutrons. But here you have one neutron, okay? If you take deuterium, wait, let me draw it down since you all can see hydrogen, two, one, okay? So this is the mass number, this is the atomic number. So here there are one proton, there is one proton. Here, this is the mass number. Here, this is also the mass number. Here there are zero neutrons, okay? Zero neutrons. There are no neutrons, okay? There are no neutrons, but here there is one neutron. There is one neutron, okay? Let me teach it once again. Protium, if you take protium, this is the standard representation. If you take deuterium, this is the standard representation of deuterium. Why? Protium has one as the mass number, which means there are zero neutrons, okay? There are zero neutrons. Then you take deuterium. Then 2 is the mass number. The mass number of deuterium is 2. Okay, the mass number of deuterium is 2. Then there is 1 neutron. And then you have tritium. Tritium is, this is the mass number. This is the atomic number. Then there are 2 neutrons in tritium. This is how you standardly represent the isotopes of hydrogen. Isotopes of hydrogen. Okay, so whenever I am teaching, it's better if you all can uh, mark the important points in your textbook or else take some notes by scribbling on a piece of paper. Okay, so protium, deuterium, tritium are the three isotopes of hydrogen. So we will be discussing now, we almost discussed how to draw, okay, how to write it standardly, how to display the Standard isotopes of hydrogen. Okay, how to display the standard isotopes of hydrogen. Fine. Now we almost discussed about isotopes, energy level diagrams. Now you all have a thorough knowledge about the lesson. Almost the main part is done. Okay, almost the main part is done. Then you have the patterns which are seen in the periodic table. Patterns seen in the periodic table. Okay, patterns in the periodic table. You just have two patterns in your syllabus for now. One is first ionization energy. And the other one is electronegativity. First ionization energy and electronegativity. Okay. So what is first ionization energy? Okay. We are studying what is the first ionization energy. So if you say the first ionization energy, the mean energy which should be supplied to an atom to remove one electron. The minimum energy supplied to an atom to remove one electron. Okay. Minimum energy supplied to an atom to remove an electron. Okay. What is this? Now, what is the first energy? energy? Okay. To remove an electron. Okay. There are two patterns seen in the periodic table. According to your syllabus, you will be studying about this. 
which is first ionization energy and electronegativity. First ionization energy is the minimum energy which is supplied to an atom to remove an electron. The minimum energy supplied to an atom to remove an electron. Then if you take first of all, first ionization energy, let's say, okay, first ionization energy. Okay, so under the first ionization energy, now if you draw the periodic table first of all, okay, let me draw the periodic table first of all. This is the periodic table, okay? This is the periodic table. Now, the first ionization energy, okay, we can, now the first ionization energy is highest, okay? You have a very high first ionization energy only in the noble gases, only in helium, neon, and argon. These are known as noble gases because they exist freely in the environment. You call it as noble gases. So, the first ionization energy is very high in helium. In neon, it is very high. In argon also, it's very high. Okay. Basically, why do we call it as high? Because their last energy shell is, their last energy level is completed. Okay. The last energy level is completed. Okay. The reason for it is, now if you say helium, there are two electrons in the last energy level. Or you can say first or last energy level. If you take helium, first or last energy level, there are two electrons. The energy level is completed. And if you take neon, two, eight electrons, and it is completed. Okay. The reason is they are stable. Okay. They are stable. They don't have to borrow. They don't have to give. They don't have to move. Okay. They just have to stay because their energy levels are completed and they are filled. Neon energy level. Neon has two energy levels. In the first energy level, there are two electrons. In the other energy level, there are eight electrons. Okay. So, altogether, there are ten electrons. Altogether, there are ten electrons. Has neon... Ha now, if you say, does neon have any shortage of electrons or does neon have to borrow an electron? No. Basically, neon has 10 electrons. It is the 10 is the atomic number of neon. And in the two energy levels as well, there are 10 electrons for neon. So, neon is also a stable. Now, helium, neon and argon, they are stable noble gases in the periodic table. They are stable and they are noble gases. And they are present in the periodic table. And if you did the first high ionization energy, if you did the first ionization energy, for noble gases, helium, neon, and argon, the first ionization energy is very high. Throughout the periodic table, the first ionization energy is very high. Okay. So, first ionization energy, the unit we can measure first ionization energy is Kj mol minus 1 kilojoules per mol. Okay. Kilojoules per mol. Okay. So, if you say Kj mol minus 1. So, basically, that is first ionization energy. You What you have to say is, which is very high. First ionization energy is very high only in noble gases. Only in noble gases. The noble gases are helium, neon, and argon. Okay? Helium, neon and argon. So, the first ionization energy is very high only in noble gases. They are helium, neon and argon and the unit used to measure the first ionization energy is kilojoules per mole. Okay. Kilojoules per mole. Okay. That is the first pattern of the periodic table. First pattern of the modern periodic table. Then we are going towards electronegativity. Okay. Electronegativity. For that also, we have to draw the periodic table. So, 
So don't mind the periodic table. That's how it should be. Okay. So if you take this is the periodic table, now we are studying about electronegativity. We almost studied about the first ionization energy. If you take electronegativity, electronegativity basically means the ability of an atom or an element to attract electrons of a bond towards itself. Okay. The ability of an atom or electron to attract electrons of a bond towards itself. So if you say electronegativity is basically about attracting attracting electrons it is about attracting electrons electronegativity is very high in fluorine and chlorine and remember noble gases noble gases has no electronegativity they have no electronegativity okay they have no electronegativity only fluorine and chlorine have the highest electronegativity. Let me explain why. Now if you say 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Fluorine is in the ninth position of the periodic table. It has 9 electrons. So I put it as fluorine. Okay, 2 in the first level. 7 electrons in the outer level. Okay, there are 7 electrons. For this to be complete, for this to be complete, for the fluorine atom to be complete, for the fluorine atom to be complete, basically to be complete in the sense having eight electrons in the outermost shell. For it to be complete, it needs to attract electrons, right? So fluorine almost has seven electrons. It just needs one electron to complete. So if it gets that one electron, then fluorine is a complete atom. Okay, fluorine is a complete atom. So basically, the maximum number of electrons in the energy level in order to fulfill the octet rule, we call this as the highest elements which are classified under electronegativity. Okay, fluorine has very high electronegativity. Why is the reason? Does it have eight electrons in the energy level? No, but it can get eight electrons if it only gets just one electron. So the ability to attract electrons towards itself is known as electronegativity. Basically, attracting electrons towards itself. Towards itself. The ability to attract electrons towards itself is known as electronegativity. In the periodic table, fluorine and chlorine has a very high electronegativity. And the noble gases have no electronegativity. Okay, the noble gases have no electronegativity. Okay, I hope I understood. And just remember, electronegativity is measured through the polling scale. It is measured through the polling scale. Okay, it is measured through the polling scale. Understood? Once again, there are two patterns in the periodic table. First, ionization energy and then the electronegativity. Noble gases, helium, neon and argon have very high first ionization energy. It is basically the minimum energy supply to an atom to remove an electron. That is first ionization energy. And then first ionization energy, the unit of first ionization energy is kilojoules. Okay. Kilojoules per mole. This is for first ionization energy. Okay, and then if you take electronegativity, electronegativity is basically attracting electrons towards itself. Attracting electrons towards itself is known as electronegativity. Then if you take electronegativity, uh, noble gases have no electronegativity. Only fluorine and only fluorine and chlorine have highest electronegativity. They now these also have electronegativity, but only fluorine and chlorine have highest. Okay, highest electronegativity and electronegativity is being measured by the polling scale. If you are clear up to now, can I have a thumbs up or an emoji? Okay, so I hope you are very clear with that. So we studied about first energy, energy electronegativity. Then we will be studying about metals, non-metals and metalloids. We will be studying about metals, non-metals and metalloids. If you take the periodic table, once again, now this is the fourth time I'm drawing the periodic table. The reason is because the periodic table is must in this lesson. Okay. Hydrogen, helium, lithium.
this is the periodic table. Okay, this is the modern periodic table. So if you take the modern periodic table, you know these are noble gases. These are noble gases. Okay, these are noble gases. And then we have metalloids in our periodic table. We have metalloids. And then we have nonmetals. Nonmetals. And then we have metals. And then we have metals. Okay. First of all, if you take the periodic table, you have noble gases, and then you have two boron and silicon are metalloids, and then you have nonmetals. And then you have metals in the periodic table. Okay. You have these categories in the periodic table. Just remember lithium and all these up to aluminium are metals. These are metals. Boron and silicon are metalloids. While these six, sorry, these eight are non-metals. Okay. These eight are non-metals. While these are classified as noble gases. Helium. Neon and argon. These are known as noble gases. So this is how the periodic table is divided. Okay. Okay, dear. Why do we call these gases as noble gases in the sense these gases exist free in the environment? Have we ever heard about now? You know hydrogen, oxygen, and everything, right? But now, if you take this helium, neon, and argon, they exist free in the environment, okay? They are already stable gases because they have, you know, they have complete energy levels. Helium has a complete energy level of two electrons. Neon has a complete energy level. Outermost energy shell is completed by eight electrons. Same like that. They don't have to give or they don't have to take electrons. They are almost stable. Okay, they are almost very stable. So that's the reason why they have named these as noble gases and also they exist free in the environment. So metals, non-metals, noble gases and metalloids. This is how the periodic table is divided into. Noble gases, metalloid, non-metals and just remember hydrogen is also a non-metal. Non-metal. And then metals, okay? Fine. This is how the periodic table is classified according to metal, non-metal, and metalloids, okay? I hope you understood till that part. Fine. Speaking about metals, we have to speak about sodium and magnesium, okay? Sodium and magnesium. And if speaking about non-metals, in your syllabus, we just have to speak about nitrogen, chemical properties of nitrogen, sulfur, carbon, and those things. If we are speaking about metalloids, I have to speak about boron and silicon. And then we have to speak about the chemical formula, and then we can end the session. So we have almost come to the latter part of the session. Now we are going to discuss about non-metals. Sorry, first of all, let's discuss about metals, okay? Put the topic as metals. If you take metals, out of all the elements identified so far, 80 of them are metals, okay? So metals are basically, what you can say is, now these are native, now native elements, okay? Native elements, they even exist as compounds. Okay, many metals such as iron, aluminium, magnesium, these are existing as compounds. And out of the 80 elements found so far, out of all the elements found so far, 80 of them are metals. So today we will be discussing only about few metals. First metal we are discussing about is sodium. But before that, you should know some physical properties as well as chemical properties of metals. Physical properties, now if I say metals, they are a physical as well as chemical property. Physical, chemical. Okay, physical, chemical. Okay, they are a, now we have discussed about the physical as well as chemical properties of metals. If it is the physical properties of metals, you have metallic cluster. 
they are sonorous which gives a ringing sound and then they are malleable good conductors okay good conductors of heat and electricity then there is a high density okay these are the physical properties of metals these are the physical properties of metals then if you come to the chemical properties if you say chemical properties metals form cations or anion metals form positive cations which are known as positive cations in the sense positive ions are known as cations positive ions are known as cations so chemical properties of metals is they form cations or you can also say as cations and they combine with oxygen to form oxides okay just write down the chemical properties they form cations or you can say as cation and then they combine with oxygen to form oxides and the oxides when dissolved in water they form the basic solutions so metals are divided metals have two categories such as chemical properties as well as physical properties and the chemical properties we have you have to form cations is one chemical property combining with oxygen to form oxide and if you say the physical properties we almost discuss sonorous which is giving a ring sound good conductor right good conductor and it is malleable high density and etc these are the physical properties and if you did the uh, chemical properties you have that it forms cations it combines with oxygen to form oxides and etc these are the physical and chemical properties of metals then if you take the sodium metal if you take the sodium metal you have to study about the sodium metal too in detail sodium is also a metal okay All right, so sodium is also a metal. So the physical properties of sodium, we have to draw a table for sodium. Physical properties, chemical properties, and the uses of sodium. Physical, chemical, and uh, uses of sodium. So sodium is metal. First of all, if you speak about physical properties, you have to say that sodium is a very soft metal. Okay, it is a very soft metal. Not only that, you have to say the sodium's density is very less. Very less density. Okay, very less density. Okay. And then also sodium is a good conductor. Or it is a conductor of heat and electricity. Heat and electricity. Okay. So basically, sodium is a metal. The metal is divided now. Sodium, we can classify it according to the physical uh, properties, chemical properties, and the uses. If you take the physical properties of sodium, it is a very soft metal. It has a very less density. It's the conductor of heat and electricity. But if you take the chemical properties of sodium, it has a high reactivity towards oxygen. High reactivity towards oxygen okay towards oxygen it has a very high reactivity and also it vigorously reacts with cold water okay sodium is a metal which which vigorously reacts with cold water and also it reacts violently with dilute acids okay it reacts violently with dilute acids okay it reacts violently with dilute acids reacts violently violently with the dilute acids with the dilute acids okay so the physical properties of sodium is soft metal very less density wait give me a minute let me write it once again as you can see if you take the physical properties of sodium first of all you have to say it's a very soft metal it's a conductor of heat and electricity. And then it 
is having a very less density okay and etc but if you come to the chemical properties of sodium you should say it has a high reactivity towards oxygen vigorously reacts with vigorously reacts with cold water and then violently reacts with dilute acids violently reacts with dilute acid okay so these are the chemical properties of sodium then if you move on to the uses of sodium metal now still we are discussing about sodium okay still we are discussing about sodium if you move to the uses of sodium you can say it as you can produce sodium cyanide producing sodium cyanide, making sodium amalgam, and extracting metals such as titanium and zirconium, and gives the street lights a yellow glow. Okay, yellow glow. So this is basically the summary of sodium. You can write the physical properties of sodium, chemical properties of sodium, and the uses of sodium. If you see the physical properties, it's a soft metal, conductor of heat and electricity, very less density. Then chemical properties in the sense, high reactivity towards oxygen, vigorously reacts with cold water, violently reacts with dilute acids. If you do the uses of sodium, produces sodium cyanide, making sodium amalgam, extracting titanium and zirconium, produces a yellow glow for the street lamps, okay? This is basically regarding sodium. And then sodium should not come to contact with air. So we have to store sodium in paraffin oil or wax. Paraffin oil or kerosene. Okay, paraffin oil is basically wax. So if it hasn't come to contact with air, if we have to prevent the contact of sodium and air, we have to store it either in paraffin oil or kerosene. Okay, so this is the base, this is the basic of sodium. You have to study about the physical, chemical and uses of sodium. Physical properties, chemical properties and uses of sodium. Okay, sodium is a metal. Understood? Then let's move on to magnesium. Okay, let's move on to magnesium. Magnesium is also very easy if you have to study about magnesium. That is also very easy as well. Same like sodium, even magnesium has this chemical, physical and then uses as well. Okay, same like sodium. So if you take magnesium, Again, divide into a small table, physical properties, chemical properties and uses. Okay, that's very easy. Physical properties is it is a good conductor of heat and electricity. And it has a higher density. Higher density. Okay, it is a good conductor of heat and electricity. And it has a higher density. Then if you take the chemical properties of magnesium, it is burning with a bright white flame, bright white flame, and it reacts with hot water. Reacts with hot water. Okay. So now just I'm just splitting all in their respective columns, and then again I will explain everything. All right. Fine. So unlike sodium, magnesium is a good conductor of heat and electricity. Even though sodium was a conductor of heat and electricity, it wasn't a good conductor. And sodium had a less density, while magnesium has a high density. If you take the chemical properties of magnesium, magnesium is an element which, bright, which burns with a bright white flame. You would have seen magnesium. If you take a magnesium strip and then burn it at the end, it will give you a bright white glow white glow. So, it burns the bright white flame. It only reacts in hot water. 
okay it only reacts with hot water okay it only reacts with hot water and this is the chemical property of magnesium understood and then even magnesium reacts with dilute acids rapidly reacts rapidly with rapidly means soon reacts rapidly with dilute acids okay reacts rapidly with dilute acids so this is about magnesium physical property good conductor of heat and electricity higher density and it burns with a bright white flame comes under the chemical property take a magnesium strip burn it at the end it will give you a white glow and then it only reacts in hot water does not react in cold water and it reacts rapidly with dilute acids it reacts rapidly with dilute acids so if you take the use of magnesium you can pr produce medicines now they say milk of magnesium they say milk of magnesium when you have gastritis and all they will give you the milk of magnesium why now you get gastritis because of the acidity inside your stomach so magnesium is a base so if they give a base there will be a neutralization reaction occurring and your pain will dismiss okay you won't have the pain hereafter so the uses of magnesium is producing medicine and producing an alloy named magnesium producing an alloy named magnesium which is the combination of magnesium plus aluminium and then it is used as a metal to prevent corrosion to prevent corrosion okay to prevent corrosion of iron to prevent corrosion of iron these are the uses of magnesium first of all physical properties good conductor of heat and electricity high density chemical properties burning with a bright white flame only reacting with hot water reacting rapidly with dilute acid and then if you take the uses of magnesium you can produce the medicine the medicine which they are speaking here is the milk of magnesia milk of magnesia and then you can produce an alloy named magnesium and then which will even prevent the corrosion of iron these are the uses of magnesium i hope you understood these are the uses of magnesium so we discussed about the physical chemical properties and the uses of sodium and now we discussed about magnesium and with that we are finishing metals okay we are finishing metals now we have to study about non metals which is our second topic so we have to study about metals non metals and metalloids and then there is the way to write a formula these are very important we have to study about these four now out of these four we have almost completed metals five we have almost completed metals and then we are speaking about non metals which is our second sub topic okay non metals so non metals the properties of non metals are opposite for metals now if you say metals metals have some certain properties that right? they are opposite okay the properties of non metals are opposite of metals okay basically now as i said you non metals met, as i said you metals are malleable they are good conductors but non metals are poor conductors they are not malleable okay they have very low density and etc so if you take the non metals if you take the non metals they are opposite the properties of non metals are opposite to the properties of metals okay so some non metals are available nitrogen carbon and sulfur we will be discussing about ah uh, nitrogen carbon and sulfur nitrogen carbon and sulfur first of all let me say the chemical properties now let's say metal has some properties metal has some properties right but if you take non metal the properties are opposite you know the properties are opposite to the non metal okay the properties are opposite to the non metals okay so basically metal and non metal their properties are opposite now let's say metal as i said you it has high density metals have high density if you take non metals they are having a low density why the properties are very opposite to each other they are not matching so if you take the non metals and metals you can't compare because their properties are different to each other 
Okay, the properties are different to each other. First of all, let's study about nitrogen. Okay, okay, density in the sense now density is dear. Now, if you say you have a cup of water, or if you have something else, if you say juice, king coconut juice, or anything, if you take any liquid or a solution, you will you will know that density is something like the thickness of the particular liquid. The thickness, okay, thickness in the sense how thick is the liquid. Now, if the density of the liquid is low, now if the density of a liquid is high, you might float on water. Okay, because it is basically like you can say it's like the thickness of water, thickness of a solution. Okay, you can say it's a thickness. Now, in my words, I used to call it as thickness, so you can easily understand. If the density of a solution is low, now if you say now this is water, I'm taking water. If I add a drop of food coloring, if I add a drop of food coloring to this water or the solution. If the density of water is low, it will get mixed sooner. It will get mixed sooner. Okay. But if the density is high, we have to mix it again and again because the more thickness it is, the less solubility of the substance it is. Okay. So basically, if it is more thick, you can now, if the water has a higher density, you won't sink. You won't sink. You will sink if the water has a lesser density. So basically, in my terms, I call it as thickness. So you can also call it as mass over volume or ratio of mass over volume, which gives the formula for density. Okay, which gives the formula for density. Fine. That is density. Now, if you take non-metals, okay, non-metals. Now I said you, metals are forming cations which are positive ions, but non-metals are forming anions. Why? The properties are opposite. So the metals are forming cations, non-metals are forming anions. So if you take nitrogen, same like what we discussed for magnesium and what we discussed for sodium, even let's draw a table for nitrogen. Now I'm speaking about non-metals, okay? No more metals here. So we have nitrogen, sorry, we have the physical properties of nitrogen, chemical properties and uses. This is nitrogen, this is nitrogen. The physical properties of nitrogen is nitrogen is colorless as well as odorless, which means it has no color and it has no smell and it is Lighter than air and slightly soluble in water. Slightly soluble in water. Okay, slightly soluble in water and colorless and odorless. These are the physical properties. If you take chemical properties, it is a non-supporter of combustion. So what is the combustible gas we use? Can anybody say what is the combustible gas? Can you unmute and say what is the combustible gas? What do we... Consider as the combustible gas in our environment. Yes, very good. Oxygen is a combustible gas, right? Oxygen is a combustible gas because if there is something burning, okay, oxygen, we need oxygen for combustion, okay? Oxygen is a combustible gas, right? Okay, so now if you take nitrogen, nitrogen is a non supporter of combustion. which is not a combustible gas, okay, which is not a combustible gas. So basically, if we are studying about this lesson, we have to know about everything in detail, okay. So if you take a supporter of combustion, oxygen is a supporter of combustion. Combustion basically takes place in oxygen, okay. But if you take, um, yes, very good, oxygen is a supporter of combustion. And if you take, Nitrogen. Nitrogen is not a supporter of combustion. Okay, so we are speaking about the chemical properties. So nitrogen is a non-supporter of combustion. Low reactivity. Okay, low reactivity. And then during lightning, it forms the oxides. Okay, it forms the oxides of nitrogen. Okay, during lightning, you can say oxides of nitrogen. Oxides of nitrogen during lightning. Oxides of nitrogen. So, non-supporter of combustion, 
lower reactivity, oxides of nitrogen. If you take physical, colorless and odorless, side is soluble in water. If you take chemical, it is a non-supporter of combustion. The only supporter of combustion is oxygen and it has low reactivity and the oxides of nitrogen are occurring during lightning. And the uses, okay, the uses, if you say the uses of nitrogen, you have to say about the uses of nitrogen as well. Okay, so there are many chemical properties of nitrogen. I don't have space to write as well. But let me give it as a note. Once the seminar is over, I'll give it as a note. Okay. If you take the uses of nitrogen, nitrogen is used as a coolant to fill up vehicle tires. Okay. And it is an inert gas. Inert gas in the sense you can fill some packets with nitrogen. Now, if you take a TPT packet, if you take a snack packet or anything, you will see there's air collected inside. What do you think the air is? They used to fill these packets and all these packages with nitrogen because nitrogen is an inert gas. Nitrogen is an inert gas. So once again, physical properties of nitrogen, colorless and odorless, slightly soluble in water. Chemical properties, non-supporter of combustion, low reactivity, oxides of nitrogen are formed during lightning. And under special condition, you can even get ammon you can even form ammonia gas as well for industrial purposes. And then the uses of nitrogen are, it is a coolant to fill vehicle tires, it is an inert gas, and also you can, when packaging milk powder, nitrogen is used. Milk powder, nitrogen is used as a blanketing gas. It is used as a blanketing gas. Okay, it is used as a blanketing gas. These are the uses of nitrogen. Coolant to package milk powder is used as a blanketing gas. It is an inert gas to fill vehicle tires and etc. Nitrogen is used. So nitrogen is a very, very important non-metal in the industrial scale, in the industrial sector. Okay. Moving on to sulfur. Sulfur is our second non-metal. We will be discussing about sulfur. Okay, we'll be discussing about sulfur. So sulfur is also an element which exists in different forms. So if something is existing in many forms, okay, you call it as allotrope. So sulfur is also existing as an allotrope. Allotrope is basically different forms. It can exist in the powder shape. It can exist in crystal shape. So whatever the shape it is, whatever the form it is, if it is, you know, existing in a different form, you call it as an allotrope. You call it as an allotrope. So the physical properties of sulfur, chemical properties and uses as well will be discussed. Okay, so remember children, now the ones who joined in the beginning, they are not there till the end because now the lesson is big and we have to discuss many things under the lesson. So I have scheduled the lesson at 7, 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. Right, since it's a free session. So if we aren't able to complete it by 9 p.m., I'll stop from that part and you all can write down the notes by getting the idea from this. Okay, if you all want, I can send you some notes for this lesson. Or if we have time, let's try to complete the full lesson. But if I complete the full lesson, you all won't understand what we study. Okay, so it's just as a recap. Now the first energy, energy, electronegativity, those were the things which were important because you all you all won't study them right now energy level diagram and all you all should draw and practice but these things you all can read and understand you all can read and memorize these things so i want you much priority for this so as we finished magnesium we finished sodium we even finished nitrogen then we have sulfur and carbon under non-metals if we take sulfur also the same thing sulfur is in yellow color Sulfur is a yellow color element and it even exists as a low trop. A low trop is different forms, okay, different or various forms. Different or various forms. Okay, so if you say it is a powdered nature, you call it as amorphous, but if there are different forms or various forms, you call it as allotrope. You call it as 
allotrop it is yellow in color okay so the physical properties of sulfur are it is a poor conductor okay the physical properties of sulfur is poor conductor and insoluble in water insoluble in water these are the physical properties of sulfur poor conductor and insoluble in water if you take the chemical properties of sulfur as I'm writing, I'm going, if I see the physical properties of sulfur, poor conductor, insoluble in water. Insoluble in water. These are the physical properties of sulfur. But if you come across the chemical properties of sulfur, sulfur burns with a blue flame. Sulfur burns the blue flame. And when heated in air, okay, when heated in air, sulfur forms metal sulfide, okay, many metal forms metal sulfide. When sulfur is heated, it forms metal sulfide, okay, metal sulfide. Like you have sulfur and you are combining it with a metal and you heat it and then it produces metal sulfide okay so these are the chemical properties of sulfur the uses of sulfur is vulcanized num vulcanized rubber and then fungicides and etc uses are to vulcanize rubber and then for these firecrackers matches and everything you use sulfur and then sulfur is also used in the production of wine and beer and it is used as fungicide. Used as fungicide. So the physical properties of sulfur, poor conductor and insoluble in water. If you did the chemical properties, it has a blue flame and forms metal sulfide. If you take the use of sulfur, vulcanized rubber, wine and beer. Production of producing wine and beer and it is used as a fungicide. These are the uses for sulfur. Okay, these are these are the uses for sulfur. So, as I'm writing it down here, uses for sulfur, chemical properties of sulfur, physical properties of sulfur. Okay, and then even the uses of sulfur. Okay, sulfur is a non-metal. Fine. So now we have a sulfur, and then next we have to move on to carbon. So carbon is also same like that. You all can read the book and understand those. Okay, so we have to contain metals, non-metals, metalloids, and valency. Now we have to complete these by nine o'clock. Okay, so metals we did, non-metals I discussed about sulfur. Okay, I discussed about sulfur, and then we only had we had discussed about nitrogen. Here we discussed about sodium and magnesium. The ones who are with me till the very beginning will know how did I do everything in the order and how did I teach you all everything briefly. Okay. So basically metal, if you say sodium and magnesium, non-metals you have sulfur, nitrogen and carbon. Carbon is also the same. Okay. You have to know carbon is also occurring in abundance in nature. Then you have to know that carbon has two forms. Carbon has two forms such as crystal form and the amorphous form and that is something regarding carbon. Okay, that is something regarding carbon. Fine. So let's finish with carbon and then we will finish with non-metal. Okay. Now carbon is also a non-metal which is occurring in nature. Okay. Which is occurring in nature. This is the standard symbol for carbon. Capital C. Okay. So basically the carbon is also divided into two forms such as Crystalline and amorphous. And amorphous. Okay, crystalline form and amorphous form. So crystalline form, you have diamond, graphite, fullerene, and etc. These are under crystalline form. But if you take the amorphous form, you have charcoal, lamp soot. You can even write it here. 
charcoal, lamp suit, coal and etc. These are the amorphous forms of carbon. Carbon divides into crystalline form and then the amorphous form. Crystalline form you have diamond and graphite. Amorphous form you have charcoal, coal and etc. The physical properties of carbon, chemical properties and then uses. Okay. Let's see the physical properties of carbon. Okay. So the physical properties of carbon is poor conductor of electricity. Okay, it is a poor conductor of electricity, but then their density is very low. And they, these are some physical properties of carbon. Now, if you take carbon, carbon occurs in abundance. There are two types of carbon, crystalline form and the amorphous form. Then the physical properties of carbon are poor conductor of electricity. Density is relatively low. And then graphite is a good conductor. Graphite is a good conductor, but uh, normally, if you take uh, physical properties of carbon, it is a poor conductor, but only graphite. Graphite is a good conductor of electricity. So, the physical properties in the sense, you know, this, uh, this is all about the physical properties of carbon. And also, you can say it as carbon exists in black color. Carbon exists in black color. Okay, carbon is existing in black color. So, the physical properties, poor conductor of electricity, density is low, and it is in black color. Okay, then we have the chemical properties as well. Okay, chemical properties as well. Chemical properties in the sense it has low reactivity. Okay, it has a very low reactivity and it combines with oxygen at high temperature, but it does not, carbon does not react with acids, bases, and chlorine. Okay, so the physical properties of carbon, as I said, is the poor conductor and its density is very low. But when it comes to chemical properties, it has a low reactivity, does not react. Okay, carbon does not react with acids, bases, and chlorine. Okay, the only element which does not react now, the only element. Which does not react with, no, it's not the only element, but an element which does not react with acids, bases, and chlorine is carbon, which is a chemical property. Same as they might ask you some unique properties, okay? They might ask you some unique properties. Unique properties in the same, which element burns with a bright white flame? That is magnesium. Which element burns with a blue flame? That is sulfur. Same like that, they might give you an outstanding property of that particular element and they will say you to identify it. So if you say chemical properties of carbon, it has a low reactivity, does not react with acids, bases or salts or chlorine, acid, bases and chlorine. It does not react with acids, bases and chlorine. Okay. And then same like that, if you go to the uses of carbon, there are many uses of carbon like, you know, they will say making pencils as a fuel, vulcanizing rubber, absorbing gases as a good conductor. These are some uses of carbon. Go through page number 72 in your textbook. You will see a chart. Then you all can go through all the uses of carbon in that particular chart. Okay. Same like that. Now we have come to the end of the lesson. We only have to discuss about metalloids. We are just going to discuss about metalloids. So if you take metalloids, you have silicon and you have boron. Because silicon as well as boron. If you take silicon, they are used in making solar cells and everything. Solar cells. Now let's just see the uses of silicon and boron. Okay. Then we can go to the other part. Because almost our time is up. So silicon and boron. If you take silicon, Silicon, you can make trans, you can make solar cells, computer equipments, and then transistors and diodes. Transistors and diodes. So basically, silicon, it, it is a metalloid. Metalloid is, it's neither a metal nor a non-metal. So under metalloids, you have silicon, which you have solar cells, computer equipments, and transistors and diodes. You can Make solar cells, 
computer equipment, transistors and diodes. These are the uses of silicon. And then if you take boron, okay, boron is used in welding metals and it is used in making skin, skin cream and then used in making glass. Welding metals, skin cream and making glass. Okay, and making glass. Okay, so if you take metalloids, you have silicon as well as boron. In silicon, you have you can make solar cells, computer equipment, transistors, and diodes. And if you take boron, you can have this. You can make welding metals. You can make skin cream. See, welding metal, skin cream, and you can make glass. Make. Glass. These are the uses or the industrial benefits of silicon and boron. And these both are considered to be metalloids. Okay. These both are considered to be metalloids. Okay. So the two metalloids are silicon and boron. Silicon, you can make solar cells, computer equipment, transistors, and diodes. And if you take boron, you can weld, you can make welding metals, skin cream, and you can make glass. These are the uses of boron as well. Okay, so now as we have come to the last part of the session, we are going to see how can we write a chemical formula. We are going to see how can we write a chemical formula. There are some polyatomic ions also known as radicals in your textbook where you have ammonium, hydronium, nitrate, permanganate, chromate, dichromate and everything. You all have to memorize those, okay? You all have to memorize those. So basically, now if you take this, now how to write a chemical formula? Let's say I am asking you to write the chemical formula for potassium carbonate. Potassium carbonate. I am saying you write the chemical formula for potassium carbonate. So potassium is K. Carbonate is CO3 2 minus. Carbonate is CO3 2 minus. It is a polyatomic ion. It's a polyatomic ion, or you can also call it as a radical. You can also call it as a radical. Okay. Fine. So if you are writing the chemical formula for potassium carbonate, you have to put K over here, CO3 2 minus over here. So, potassium, the valency of potassium is 1. The valency of potassium is 1, okay? So, if you go through the valency, the combining ability of an atom, valency is the combining So, we are skipping few parts because according to the time management and everything, I should leave you all to go by 9 p.m. So, I am teaching all the most important parts of the session since this lesson cannot be covered within two hours. But however, I managed to do it and with your cooperation as well. So, valency is basically combining ability of an atom. So, here you have potassium. Here you have the radical or the polyatomic ion of carbonate. So you have potassium, CO3, 2 minus, and then here you have 1. So you are taking this 2, you are taking this 1 and crossing between each other. So you are putting the 2 over here and you are putting the 1 over here. You are putting the 2 over here and then you are putting the 1 over here. Okay, you are putting the 2 over here, then you are putting the 1 over here. So basically it happens like this. K, CO3, 2 minus. Here the valency is 1. Here the valence is 2. Why they have mentioned 2 here? So you are crossing, you are crossing it, okay? You are crossing it. Then potassium gets the 2, K2, and then CO3. Why 1 do we have to mention? No, we don't have to mention the 1. So K2, CO3 is the chemical formula for potassium carbonate. <clears throat> Carbonate, okay. So that is how we have to write a chemical formula by using valency. Same like that, not only for carbonate, you have for phosphate, 
hydronium dichromate chromate sulfate and etc now let's try something else too okay sodium nitrate ah sodium nitrate we are writing the chemical formula for this so sodium is na nitrate is no3 minus which is one right so the valency of sodium is also one valency of nitrate is also one you cross it in a in o3 this is the chemical formula for sodium nitrate i hope you all understood what we did till now did you all understand this is the ending of the lesson we studied about electronegativity for ionization before that we drew the electric energy shells we drew all those diagrams like i drew for sodium i drew for helium and everything we got a brief idea regarding the periodic table as well we got a idea regarding the planetary model of the atom how the electrons are organized within the energy levels and we just did everything within 2 hours we started at 7 and we are ending at 9 and it's a free session so i hope you all understood till that part so if you all want to sign up for the classes if you all want to sign up for the classes you all can contact the number okay you all can contact the number in the flyer and then if you are very good dear i am so happy to know okay so i hope you all understood everything okay so i am really glad that you all understood so if you are a 2024 all our batch student i will be keeping theory classes as well as the fast track classes for you and if you are a 2025 all our batch student then i will be keeping theory class as well if you all are willing to join you all can drop a message and also there will be yes dear i provide recordings i will be providing this recording i'll be uploading this in the group okay so if you all are having some doubt regarding some physics lessons this sunday there will be a physics seminar on the lesson hydrostatic pressure which is a very important lesson it won't it won't be conducted by me it will be conducted by a very very non qualified sir so you all can join us in session is totally free of charge okay so whoever joined my class in the beginning okay if you all are with me from the beginning i hope you understood the lesson which we did now so for 2024 or next there is a fast track program which i'm hoping to start with if we gather some other students too so then we can do the fast track program as well since i'm new to the institute this is my first free session i hope you all enjoyed it okay okay ma welcome you are mostly welcome okay so basically you all can join if you all want so let's let's hope to keep other free sessions as well or else you all can join or you all can sign up for the classes and on this sunday there will be a physics seminar it is free of charge it is done by sir you all can join and see and it's done in the knowledge institute as well okay so that's all with everything we studied about lesson structure of matter today so if you all want any inquiries you all can drop me a message okay the time as well i'll i'll upload the poster in the group and i'll share the poster as well okay there will be details in that okay there will be the details so basically today we studied the lesson structure of matter i hope you understood the lesson very well so it is just an introduction to chemistry and this is that so yeah so now let me wind up the session a very good evening and assalamu alaikum and let's stop the session if you all have any doubts you all can drop me a message in the group or else you all can text privately and ask okay barakallah okay then let's wind up the session thank you